So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. So in this presentation, I'll be presenting data from the Kirby Institute's ongoing study of HIV treatment as prevention in homosexual male serodiscordant couples, the opposite to track study. So in this analysis, we investigated whether there is evidence of behavioral risk compensation in this cohort over time. In studies of serodiscordant heterosexual couples, HIV treatment is associated with a substantial, substantially reduced HIV transmission risk. We have evidence that treatment as prevention is effective from the now very familiar HPTN052 study um, of treatment and transmission in heterosexual serodiscordant couples, um, HPTN052, which showed a 96% reduction in transmission risk when the HIV positive partner was on treatment. And more recently, we have the first evidence of the potential effectiveness of treatment as prevention in gay men, which came from the interim analysis from the partner study presented earlier this year at Croy. And this showed no transmissions after two years in heterosexual or homosexual serodiscordant couples who were having condomless sex with each other and who, where the positive partner had undetectable viral load. Although it should be noted that the result was also statistically consistent with some risk of transmission per year. So in most such studies, um, and indeed almost any clinical studies on the use of antiretroviral um, based forms of HIV prevention, there's been little evidence of uh, behavioral risk compensation. That is where people may use condoms less often due to the protection perceived to be provided by some other means, in this case, antiretrovirals by the HIV positive partner. And typically, clinical studies tend to show a decrease in condomless sex over time, perhaps due to the participants continually coming into contact with the clinic and the education that may be provided there. So we were interested to see if there's any evidence of behavioral risk compensation within our ongoing opposite to track study cohort. Opposite to Tract is an observational, prospective, longitudinal cohort study where the unit of recruitment is a homosexual serodiscordant couple. The primary aim of the study is to determine the degree to which HIV treatments reduce HIV transmission risk in relation to anal sex. And the study design is similar but not identical to the partner study currently ongoing in Europe. It is an international, multi-site study being conducted in 14 clinics in Australia, one clinic in Brazil and one clinic in Thailand. The couples are followed up over time by attending clinic visits at least two times per year, and at every visit, the HIV positive partners have their viral load and CD4 count tested, and the negative partners are tested for HIV antibodies. Both partners complete an online questionnaire after or at each clinic visit exploring sexual behavior, attitudes, and other factors, including HIV negative partners' perception of his positive partner's viral load. In cases of HIV negative partners seroconverting during follow-up, phylogenetic analysis will be conducted on viral samples from both partners to determine if the transmission was within the couple or whether it came from an outside partner. But these analyses will be performed once the study has been completed. So to date, we have 170 couples that are enrolled and about 85% of these are still under follow-up. This analysis, however, will focus on only the 124 couples recruited in Australia up to early June 2014. So we restricted the analysis just to the Australian couples um, because our two international sites only recently just opened. So the key research question for this analysis today is whether there is evidence of behavioural risk compensation in this cohort. That is, do the HIV negative partners report more condomless anal sex with their HIV positive study partners when they perceive their partner to have undetectable viral load? And are these patterns sustained over time? So perceived viral load was chosen rather than the actual viral load that we get from the pathology testing, because when it comes to making decisions around condom use within these relationships or not, it is the HIV negative partner's beliefs about the partner's viral load that is more likely to influence behavior. So moving on to the results. So as mentioned earlier, by Ju early June 2014, we had 124 couples enrolled in Australia, and 87% had attended at least one follow-up visit. And you can see how the follow-up visits fall there. One couple had had a total of 14 visits, but the main number is only three visits per couple in that time. So the main number of days between visits was 105, indicating that most couples are attending clinic visits more than twice a year. To date, there are officially 99 couple years of follow-up in the cohort. However, for this analysis, since it focuses on only on behavioral data, we've also included the three months prior to baseline in the overall follow-up time. So this analysis um, includes 129 couple years. Briefly, in terms of the demographics in the sample so far, the average age of participants is the late 30s, early 40s. The vast majority identify as gay. Just over half report Anglo-Australian ethnicity, and around half are university educated. 
So the opposite to track study is open to any men who regularly have sex with a serodiscordant male partner. So it was broader than what we might think of as, or consider as traditional romantic and committed couples. We also don't require the couples to have been together or having sex together for any period of time before they enrol. Um, and indeed, we actively seek newer relationships, given that previous evidence um, from our institute indicates that the first year is the most risky time for HIV transmission in these couples. So to give you a sense of what kind of couples we're getting into the cohort so far, we can see that one third are fairly new sexual relationships of less than 12 months, one third have been having sex for one to five years, and one third five or more years. And furthermore, about 70% report that they live together, while the vast majority, 96%, describe their study partner as a partner, a boyfriend, or a husband, or one of those kinds of words. And taken together, this indicates that while we are attracting a good amount of people in early relationships, the majority are what we would consider romantic and committed relationships, rather than sort of casual yet regular. Also, just point out that about half of the HIV negative partners report sex outside of the relationship with other partners. At baseline, about 90% of HIV positive partners were taking treatment. And this proportion does appear to be slightly increasing over the follow-up. So by follow-up four, it's reached about 93%. But as I, mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, HIV positive partners have their viral load tested at every visit. And at baseline, three quarters had um, undetectable viral load. However, although approximately one quarter technically had a detectable viral load, it was clear that for most, the viral load was very low. So when considering viral load in terms of more or less than 400 copy, um, copies per meal, a fairly standard cutoff used internationally to define viral suppression, only 10% actually had viral load greater than 400 copies. So this difference is primarily because of the increasing levels of viral load sensitivity um, in the tests. And the laboratories in the study use various assays um, with different lower limits of detection in our study. So at baseline, 77.4% of HIV negative partners perceive their positive partner um, to have an undetectable viral load. And as with actual viral load, this does appear to be increasing over time during follow-up. Overall, the perceptions of the viral load were mostly in accord with the pathology results. However, the HIV negative partners um, did tend to overestimate detectable viral load, which most likely relates, to, again, to the introduction of more sensitive viral load tests over the past few years. So that is that these changes have actually moved some men who previously had undetectable viral load to have detectable viral load. So moving now to sex within the couples, and in particular condomless anal sex. At baseline, two-thirds of HIV negative partners reported having had any condomless sex with their study partner in the last three months. Nearly 60% reported insertive condomless sex, while nearly 40% reported re receptive condomless sex withdrawal, and nearly one-fifth reported receptive condomless sex with ejaculation. And these proportions, again, were very similar throughout follow-up. Another way of looking at condomless sex is to examine the total number of reported acts across the entire analysis period. So in total, just over 9,000 acts of anal sex within couples have been reported, with a mean of 75 acts per couple. Nearly 70% of all anal sex acts were without condoms. And within the condomless sex acts, 60% were insertive, about 20% of the condomless acts were receptive without ejaculation, and 20% with ejaculation. So I'll now move on to the primary analysis, which is the association between perceived viral load and condomless sex, aiming to determine if there's any evidence of behavioural risk compensation in this cohort. So first I'll present two ways of just looking at the baseline data, so that is the three months before baseline, and then I'll show um, how this association looks across the whole period of follow-up. So in terms of whether they had any condomless sex in the last three months before baseline, the data indicated that HIV negative partners were nearly four times more likely to report condomless sex with their study partner when the perceived viral load was undetectable. And there was a similar pattern when it came to any receptive condomless sex, with those perceived to have an undetectable viral load two and a half times more likely to report any unprotected re uh, receptive sex. And when we look at the number of acts reported in the last three months prior to baseline, there was a similar result. You can see the medians there. This table also shows the breakdown by type of condomless sex, indicating the association held true for in the insertive acts of condomless sex, but in this case, there was no significant difference between undetectable and detectable perceived viral load when it came to the number of acts of receptive condomless sex, or the pattern itself was in a similar direction. Finally, using generalised linear models, we have the association between perceived viral load and condomless sex from data across the entire period of follow-up, and this is as reported by the HIV-negative partners. 
These analyses once again use the categorical outcome variable of any columnless sex in the last time period and control for the length of time under follow-up as well as intersubject variability. So for each of the three models, we can see that unprotected anal sex was more likely when the HIV negative partners perceived his partner's viral load to be undetectable. And for all three types, condomless anal sex was approximately twice as likely when perceived viral load was undetectable. And we can also look at this graphically for the three types of anal condomless anal sex. So in conclusion, we can see that among Australian gay male serotis cordon couples in this study, condomless sex within the relationship is common and is much higher than what has been found in gay community, other gay community surveys in Australia. For example, in the Australia's national HIV uh, behavioural surveillance studies, only 40% of men in serotis cordon relationships report condomless sex with that partner. Secondly, the HIV negative partner's perception of his positive partner's viral load is strongly related to an increased practice of condomless sex, which provides some evidence that risk compensation is occurring and that the pattern of risk comp compensation is sustained over time. Whether or not this is important for HIV transmission will depend on whether HIV transmission occurs at very low levels of viral load, which is still relatively uncertain. So that is, if having an undetectable viral load is proven to be safe or fairly effective in terms of HIV transmission in homosexual couples, then ultimately behaviour risk compensation doesn't really matter for HIV transmission within these couples. And more evidence on the true risk will arise from both opposites attract and the partner study in the years to come. So our data demonstrate that risk compensation may be more evident for insertive than receptive condomless sex. However, the longitudinal analysis across follow-up did demonstrate a significant association between any receptive condomless sex and perceived detectable viral load. Undetectable viral load, sorry. And finally, the opposite track study does continue to recruit new couples, both in Australia and particularly in our new sites in Brazil and Thailand. And these will be followed up for at least another 18 months. And so to finish, I'd like to thank all the study participants, study investigators, site investigators and study coordinators, the lab staff and our community partners. Thank you.